Namaskar, I'm Harpreet Kaur and I welcome you all to our live and interactive session. You are watching us on our eVidya channel number 9. Well, today for the students of class 9, we are conducting this session. The subject that we have taken up is English and uh, under the subject, we are going to talk about the lesson number 7 of a textbook. Yes, titled Reach for the Top, Santosh and Sharapova. And it's a live and interactive session, but yes, in a short while from now, when this particular session will be uploaded on YouTube, you can watch the recorded uh, session and you can revise the concepts that we will be discussing in the session. And now uh, to have a discussion on this session, you know, on this particular topic in the session, we have invited our expert in the studio. We have with us Dr. Amit Ranjan. Welcome to the session, sir. Thank you. Sir is Assistant Professor of English from CIET and CERT New Delhi and uh, if you want to speak to him regarding any doubt that you must be having, uh, you know, off related to the topic that we are going to discuss, you are most welcome to do that. Just take down our contact number which is double eight double zero double four zero double five nine. And you can also send us an email with the suggestions, feedback and of course your questions. You can write to us at tth.class9 at ciet.nic.in. Our uh, official YouTube channel is NCERT official and of course on the same you can watch the recorded uh, session on this particular topic in a while from now. And now let's move ahead in the session. Let me tell you once again that this particular session is men, especially for the students of class 9. The subject is English and we will be discussing lesson number 7 titled Reach for the Top, Santosh and Sharapova. Well, uh, title itself is very encouraging, inspiring, I must say. Indeed. Um, but what exactly are we going to learn in the session? Uh, please tell us about the same to our students and viewers. Sure. So there's lots to learn from these um, two people. They're just exemplars of um, um, top achievers. And this is also on the eve of um, Women's Day, which is coming in a week. And so I chose um, this chapter to discuss today because these are two very inspiring um, women of the recent times who have um, um, reached um, the heights of their um, career in their respective fields. So uh, the first part of the chapter is um, dedicated to Santosh Yadav, um, who Indians know very well as uh, the climber of Mount Everest, not once but twice. So um, she holds multiple um, records um, in this of being the youngest climber, youngest woman climber to climb <coughs> um, and uh, one who climbed twice sub in subsequent years in 1992 and 93. And Maria Sharapova, the Russian uh, tennis star, also an American uh, tennis star because um, she uh, trained in America, but she um, also at a very young age um, um, became the world number one in um, tennis, which is, um, uh, let's say, the most competitive sport um, uh, in the athletic world. So um, both of them, um, struggled against um, lots mm -hmm. of odds to get uh, where they are and none of neither of them was uh, born with uh, any privilege uh, in that direction um, and so um, they are fine examples of um, how we should get inspired um, uh, by uh, these uh, achievers and how how their struggles were and how to achieve mm -hmm. despite these struggles Absolutely. You said it very rightly. They're fine examples of sheer determination and courage. So we will be discussing about these two women's stalwarts and uh, let's start with uh, Ms. Santosh Yadav. Absolutely. You know, about uh, her contributions, about her achievements and how she became uh, the role model that she is today. Absolutely. So uh, Santosh Yadav was born in um, Haryana, which is um, known to be a conservative uh, state when it comes to um, the segregation between um, boy and girl child. And, mm -hmm. um, it's very conservative um, society. And so she was the sixth child uh, of a family. Interestingly, all her other five um, uh, siblings were brothers. Mm -hmm. So when a uh, holy man, a sadhu, came to the house when her, um, her mother was expecting mm -hmm. and he wanted to bless her with her son, and interestingly, the family members and the grandmother said, No, we do, do not want a son because they had five sons already. <laughs> and um, so that's how the legend goes, or the folk tale goes, of course, there are um, folklore around um, celebrities all the time. So um, she um, was the sixth child and the youngest and the daughter. And she was a rebel uh, f um, from the childhood. 
and we see a glimpse of that in her grandmother uh, who wanted uh, a girl child ardently at this point of time must have been inspired by her mother by her grandmother um, and so she used to wear shorts and uh, play like boys in the fields whereas it was expected of girls to dress in a certain manner and behave in a certain manner and um, to quote um, santosh if i choose a correct and rational path people around me should change not me mm. so um, she defied um, all the norms and all the conservative uh, things that were there um, around her to assert herself and so uh, but uh, however you can you can rebel only to a point so even though she was from an affluent family uh, she was sent um, at the local school and not to delhi mm. as um, a boy in that family would probably have been sent to a boarding mm. school somewhere but being a girl she was um, uh, kept at home um, <clears throat> and there was pressure also to get married at the age of um, uh, 16 so yes we are in the 21st century but this um, still happens that um, um, there are many families which want their girls married off at very young age of 16 oh. or 18 however santosh was not to be cowed down and she rebelled and decided to go to delhi to study for her class 12 for her intermediate and um, when her parents refused she said that she'd uh, do part time jobs and sustain herself that she did not need support from them and that's when the parents relented and um, uh, supported her during her intermediate education they did come around um after that she went to jaipur um, for her undergraduate uh, for graduation studies and there from a hostel room she would um, see the aravalli mountain range and be very fascinated by these people climbing the range and vanishing mm. um while climbing so she uh, contacted the mountaineers um, the mountaineering club of a college perhaps and um, joined them and started training with them and um, then she um, the famous nehru institute of mountaineering in uttarkashi she went there and trained there went, went for her first trek there and um, um, by 1992 she was able to go on an everest um, expedition and uh, she scaled the mount everest in her first attempt at a very young age of um, yes. 20 and not just that um, she just did not scale the mount everest but uh, she helped two of her colleagues who were in grave danger um, so uh, one of them died at the south pole and um, she was uh, she gave whatever care and support she could give to this um, person um and the other one um probably called mohan singh if i remember right she shared her oxygen cylinder so oxygen is a very scant resource in the mountains because as you climb mm. um the atmosphere thins out and the oxygen gets lesser and as we know mount everest is um 8 and a half kilometers tall 8848 mm. uh, meters tall so um so she shared her oxygen put her own life at risk to um um save her um, fellow climber so the person who died at um, uh, in the mountains um, who died at south coal so at this point i take the opportunity to also um <clears throat> you know, uh, do an interdisciplinary uh, bit which is uh, uh, you have learned in geography there are various terms like coal gap pass notch saddle they are all words which are near each other and and are not quite the same so this is an exercise for you to find out what's the difference between these terms or is there a difference and uh, which languages these are borrowed from so for example pass is english it's from passage as coal is french so all these terms refer to the gap in the mount between the mountain peaks where you can cross um so saddle explains it the best um uh, Uh, because the shape of a horse saddle so the low point between two mountain peaks is is the place where you can cross um and so this is an exercise for your students to find out the differences between these terms find out images for them so anyway a colleague died at um, south coal uh, and um, in different languages there are various many other words um as you can see on your screen there's jock saddle tor egg skarte um in german so these are words in different languages so every culture that has mountains has different words for them so this is how we also learn about not just um, geographical terms but about cultural diversity 
how people of different cultures see, view different things, um, how they name certain things according to what their imagination is and so on. Anyway, coming back to um, the matter of um, Santosh Yadav and this is um, an image of um, South Kohl um, on the left and on the right is the entire journey um, to uh, <coughs> Mount Everest in which South Kohl is uh, uh, is not quite visible over here but it's the little blue mark um, at the top um, just below the summit and on the left picture is the South Ridge behind which is Mount Everest um, <coughs> right. So, um, to quote Santosh, the Indian flag was flying on top of the world and it was a very spiritual experience. That is what she said after climbing the Mount Everest. Mm. And once again to reiterate her um, achievements, she is the first woman to have climbed Mount Everest from Kanshung face. No, not the first woman, but from this side of, mm. and also the youngest woman and only a woman to do it twice. Uh, that is the biggest achievement to have done it twice in subsequent years in 92 and 93. And it is not just about climbing the mountain, not just about helping colleagues, but she also brought, her team brought 500 kilograms of garbage back from the mountains, all the plastic and, and the dump that um, uh, people leave and do not think about the ecological fragility, sensitivity of the place. Um, so that is roughly the story of um, Santosh Yadav, which is not just a story of um, uh, raw ambition, uh, but a story of deep empathy, where uh, along with um, um, uh, difficulties that she faced, she helped her colleagues. Yes. And in the face, and you can imagine the temperatures in these regions yes. are minus 20 and very difficult conditions, yes. with lack of oxygen, True. despite that you also decide to bring all the garbage back. Yes. So, um, her commitment um, and her communion with nature, her love for nature is uh, complete and uh, that is what is very inspiring that you do not need um, to be um, just single minded about your success. Of course, you are single minded about your success in a certain way, but you can take care of a lot of other aspects um, as well that yes. you need not lose the empathy in your heart in pursuit of your ambition. You can be a good person while being ambitious. Of course. I mean, we have summarized her journey in a few minutes, but I'm sure uh, this must have taken her a lot of endurance, pain, efforts over the years to, Absolutely. you know, reach the, and of course, scale Mount Everest. She not only scaled Mount Everest, but of course, as a human beings, you know, she scaled uh, the heights of empathy by, uh, you know, helping her fellow uh, mountaineers. And of course, bringing back that garbage from the mountain is uh, no small feat. It's it's something uh, which is commendable and it's something worth appreciating because in those circumstances, you're still, you know, thinking about nature. You're thinking about humanity. You're thinking about people. And you're bringing that back, uh, giving a message to the society that's not just about your personal achievements, but also what you bring to the table along with those achievements of yours. Uh, absolutely. And now let's move on to Maria Sharapova. Absolutely. And these are pictures of um, Santosh and you can see uh, on the right top is when she climbed Mount Everest and there's also the garbage bags. Mm. Then she was felicitated of course by all the political leadership of that time. She here is uh, it's with the former Prime Minister Atul Bihari Vajpayee. And this is one of her recent pictures as you can see now um, as um, a common citizen uh, of, of the country and making a speech. Maria Sharapova is, um, of course, uh, for those who follow tennis, um, is um, stunning, needs no introduction. Yeah. Uh, she is one of the most talented and uh, also the most gorgeous, glamorous um, uh, people on the tennis circuit. Um, yeah. And the uh, piece that we have in the book is actually from a newspaper. So it also introduces us to journalistic writing, the flavor of journalism, how uh, one has to keep the writing tight and flavorful at the same time. So, um, I will read out the first line how it begins and that also um, gives you a taste of how journalistic writing is done. And this is also an exercise for you to um, write about your favorite um, role models in um, um, let us say 400 words or 500 words uh, with um, the key information and um, um, inspiration intact. 
So this is how the chapter begins. There is something disarming about Maria Sharapova, something at odds with a ready smile and glamorous attire. And that something in her lifted on Monday, 22 August 2005, to the world number one position in women's tennis. So you can see the stylistics of this writing is different from regular prose writing. Um, uh, journalistic writing has to be pithy, which is sharp, crisp, short, and make the point. Um, and at the same time, it has to pull you in with something that appeals. The opening line is very important. Mm -hmm. So there is something disarming about Maria Sharapova. What does it mean? What does disarming mean? So disarming is a sort of a metaphor where we see the other person as armed. So when I am talking to you, for example, um, then I am seeing you as armed, mm. that I am defensive about something, mm. um, I am uh, careful about who I am speaking to. Mm. Um, so, uh, you know, we all have our defenses, yes, thinking, <laughs> thinking while talking to others. Sure. But uh, when you meet a disarming person, they are so charming, mm. so cool, so easy to go, that you drop those defenses. Absolutely. You don't want to be confrontational, you want to be easy, you want to be frank. So that's what uh, this writer, this journalist is saying, that this Maria Sharapova is so charming, um, that, that charm lifted her to uh, world number one spot in 2005. And so it's uh, very beautifully written that she is ambitious, but at the same time, she is sweet. She doesn't have airs about her hmm. ambition. She's also, uh, and so um, the writer also says something at odds with her ready smile and glamorous attire. So anybody who is very glamorous, hmm. uh, glamorous um, is attractive as you'd know, and with a ready smile, somebody who has a practiced uh, artificial smile and is glamorous um, would be distant, would be uh, like a movie star who you are afraid to go near to and, uh, and talk. Yes, and she was a professional model. She yeah. had a modeling career also. Absolutely. She is, um, um, also was a model. Mm -hmm. And so um, generally such a person would be snobbish, snooty, yes. um, arrogant. But um, Maria is um, very cool, very ground, um, grounded, down to earth, very easy to talk to. That's what the journalist um, opens up with. So the story of um, Sharapova is... Um, as interesting as uh, Santosh's story or even more interesting in, in certain ways because um, she is from Russia and from the coldest region in Russia, Siberia. So that probably connects Santosh and Sharapova, the cold weather of yeah. what, uh, but um, um, uh, her father Yuri um, dreamt of her becoming um, a big tennis star. Uh, he saw the potential in her. And so they migrated to um, um, America, to Florida, uh, where she got her training. And she was only 10 years um, um, then, uh, as the point number two over here says, trip to Florida, just after her 10th birthday. Her mother was left behind in uh, Siberia, and such a little girl of 9, 10 years obviously missed her mother a lot. And her father had to work um, double jobs, multiple jobs. Um, to be able to train her because um, tennis is not just a difficult sport, it's also a very costly sport. Um, you have to have the tennis racket, you need a coach, you need a diet plan, you need uh, very expensive um, training and, and all that. And America is an expensive country as well, so it was very expensive to train her. And so her father was also missing because he had to work a lot to pay for all that. And the mother was left back at home. So it was very lonely for her um, to be uh, in a hostel and she was so little with bigger girls and, and so on and so forth. So we have a quote here from uh, Sharapova which says, when you come from nothing and have nothing, you become very determined and hungry. And that is what she became. She understood the stake. And this is what I understand um, um, <coughs> about a lot of women's struggle also. Yes. Um, this is a very uh, interesting quote that when you have nothing, you become determined and hungry. You understand what the stake is. Yes, yes. Um, <coughs> and so um, there are researches uh, which show that female students do better because they understand their stake better in the society of what the cost is. Absolutely that if I do not, uh, let's say, go to college, I'll get married and so mm -hmm. on and so forth, whereas that pressure doesn't exist on guys um, in, the, in that way. 
So, um, at a very tender age of um, um, 17 or was it 16, she defeated none other than Serena Williams, the mm. reigning queen of um, and uh, who has multiple records um, at Wimbledon in 2004 uh, and dislodged uh, uh, the throne of Serena Williams that year and went on in 2005 as we saw to become world number um, one. And uh, she had a very successful um, career in tennis as well as in um, uh, modeling and she's also a wonderful um, human being. So these are the um, two stories which are very inspiring for us on the eve of um, um, Women's Day. Absolutely, because both these women, they, you know, women, they came from difficult circumstances and of course they had uh, nothing to lose but everything to gain and they desperately tried to achieve their dreams. Their family, of course, uh, somewhere supported them and somewhere they were a bit against, but they made their mark even in such difficult circumstances. So uh, since you're running short of time, but there's such an important concept that uh, sure. we must be discussing here as we'll be celebrating Women's Day this month. How do you think that women, you know, make it so nice and they're so brave that they achieve despite everything going against them and uh, I think women have some kind of special power which make them you know really unique human beings and of course uh, today in this world and age we're talking about feminism but even when the concept didn't exist women were there we had a women warriors who fought for independence struggle so how do you think that women have the special caliber and where do you you think they stand in today's society, especially in Indian context that we talk about. Sure, that will uh, take a whole hour to yes. discuss, <laughs> but um, in short, what uh, Maria says, um, that when you have nothing, um, then you become determined and hungry. There's nothing to lose and so you want to hold on to whatever is there and you understand the stake in a certain situation. So you yes. work very hard, you work with a focus. So when Maria won the Wimbledon, then her father took $10,000 from the manager mm. and went back to Russia to party with his friends. Okay. That was just an addition. Yes. But um, um, back to the question, well, feminism as an academic concept or as a political concept we understand today, but of mm. course any concept, any idea has always existed and women have always um, fought uh, for their rights and fought for um, uh, equity in society. And uh, there may be a lot of uh, confusion about how uh, people understand feminism because these are abstract ideas which have multiple appropriations, yes. multiple interpretations. But uh, very broadly, one has to understand that it is about social equity, social equality, that uh, there should be no discrimination on the basis of gender or any category that everybody should get equal opportunity mm. and have equal rights in a society what men can wear women should be able to wear if they are able to go at night women should be able to go at night and so on so forth uh, think for yourself and see how differently um, men and women are treated in the society this is also an exercise but um, these are very inspiring figures to show that despite all the odds that exist in the society uh, mountains can be overcome quite literally as we see in the Absolutely. case of Absolutely and we can see the you know, government of India has its own policies like Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, all these initiatives are coming in the fore to you know encourage a uh, girl child from achieving their dreams and of course for achieving their dreams and uh, it's not just about uh, the duty of government, what government is doing but every household can actually contribute to the same because when you educate a woman, you not only educate a family or a household, you educate a complete society and the nation eventually. So I guess this is a very interesting story where we talked about two women achievers and how they overcame all the difficulties and achieve mm -hmm. what they achieved. And uh, since uh, we are running short of time, we have to wrap up this session here. So I would like to thank you for your contribution to the session. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. And all the viewers and students, um, this is a wrap uh, for this particular session. But in a short while from now, you can watch our another live and interesting program it's going to be an online training series a web series where each day we are taking a new topic coming up with a new theme so do tune in and this is me harpreet kaur taking leave of you from this session namaskar <laughs>